Okay, uh, welcome to this second lecture of Robotics One. Uh, today we will continue with uh, an overview of some uh, results. In particular, this morning we will see a few videos of our research activities in robotics and of our, some of our colleagues uh, in France. And then we will move to uh, a presentation of the uh, several uh, type of industrial robot existing worldwide. I will, as announced, I will show you some videos, uh, some historical videos to start with, and then some more recent, including some commercial videos from uh, robot manufacturer in Europe. So, uh, why I'm presenting these things? Because I want you to uh, show some nice results first. Second, to understand why we need to study what we will study together. So, why we need to know about the anatomy of a robot, how it is constituted. In particular, we will focus on robot manipulators with fixed base, as I mentioned last time. Uh, why we need to know where are the actuators, what type of sensor can we use, what can we, use, what, what, what can we do with the sensors, or what we can let our robots do for us. And moreover, why we need to describe and analyze the kinematics and the differential motion of this uh, mechanical system. And here is one first uh, motivation. I hope you can see this video. I mean, it's not so powerful light, but here you see a, a lightweight uh, KUKA 4 robot. It's exactly the same as it, it is in our lab. This video was recorded uh, at the beginning of 2012 in, in Stanford, but we have the same setup now also in our lab. Uh, at that time, one of our PhD students was working there. Uh, so here you see the robot standing on the table. Actually, this is a lightweight robot, so it's 14 kilograms. And it's very powerful because it's able to uh, carry payloads which are about 50% of its weight, so 7 kilograms. This is very unusual. This is a new generation of lightweight robots because we will see other robots of the type, of more industrial type, and more or less you can count on uh, manipulators which weight, let's say, uh, 200, 400 kilo and can carry 6 to 10, 15 kilograms. So with a very low uh, payload to weight ratio. And we will see why is that. So this is kind of lightweight. This, is, this means that it can be mounted on a, more or less on a normal table like this one. And I have added to the video this uh, red line, if you see it, and then there's a green circle, uh, which displays what should the end effector of this robot do. So it starts from above, so this is a, a transient phase, and in practice it should cycle you know, with its end effector along this circle. Again, it's not a task of industrial importance, but we want to be sure that we are able to do this kind of trajectory defined in the Cartesian space. Now, if you think of your arm, and I invite you always to think about your arms in these things, so I'm starting from here, then somehow I have to, I see that there is an error because I, I'm not on this circle, so I have to land as fast as possible on this circle and then start doing this motion, okay? Very simple. What are the problems here? Well, first of all, this robot can do this motion in several ways. And the same is true for myself, even if I'm standing in the same place, so I'm holding my base fixed because I can, 
right here and do like this, or I can do like this, or I can do like this. Okay, I'm doing always the same motion in the Cartesian space, but I have several ways of doing things. So we would like to have the most natural uh, motion. Second aspect, it's not really in free space. This trajectory is getting very close to the table. So I need to avoid that the end effector hits the table. And I need also to avoid that the other part of the arm hits the table. It's like if I'm doing this circle on this blackbird, and then all of a sudden I'm hitting with my elbow. This is not good. So we would like to have something like that. And we developed a method for controlling the robot, executing Cartesian tasks like this, and satisfying some hard bounds on the kinematics and on the joint motion. So we need to study kinematics and how Cartesian trajectories can be mapped in different ways, in different ways into the joint space. So let's see the video now. So the robot and the factor should execute a circular trajectory in the Cartesian space with a constant speed, more or less. And here it starts from top, so it goes till it reaches the end effector circle. And now it starts performing this motion. And you see that the whole body of the robot is very close to the table. Now it stops and then it resumes motion. But we were guaranteed that this motion could be done, or our algorithm can produce a signal saying no, the way in which you have specified this task cannot be executed in any possible of the many reconfigurations that the robot could take. Okay? This is very important to have a negative answer. So in a sense, the algorithm is complete. So it's either provide a solution or says that there is no solution. Okay? Comments on this? Questions? Curiosities? Now the next video comes from north of France, uh, from uh, NINRIA uh, Institute in Rennes, in Bretagne. Uh, and here we are Use, I mean, they are using, we do the same, but uh, they are using uh, a camera uh, that should track some reference in the Cartesian space. But instead of doing the computation with a single camera mounted on the end effector of the robot and understanding how far is this object, nothing is done like this. Uh, all the motion of the robot is driven just by the information on the image plane of this camera. This is what is called image-based visual server. So I'm looking at some object, I'm recognizing some feature, and I would like that this feature follow some path or are regulated to some point. So, uh, in fact, the fissure are not moving, it's the arm that is moving, and it's moving with its camera. So when the camera moves, it's like seeing this fissure moving on the image plane. As simple as that. Like when I'm moving with my eyes, I see a person which is standing, I see it differently with respect to uh, on the plane of my eyes. In my case, I have two eyes, so I can make tri triangulation, I can understand the distances. But if you have only one camera, this is more difficult. Now, while doing this, uh, you may have some limits in the motion. Like before, you, have, you may have, in this case, the robot has joint limits. So each joint cannot rotate 360 degrees, like my elbow. I can fold it almost to zero degree, I can extend it to 180 degree, but I cannot go farther. So I have a joint limitation here. Okay, and this is true uh, for almost all joints of a robot. There are the last joints of 
roll around the approach axis that may rotate 360 degrees or even 720 degrees or even uh, an infinite number of times. But apart from those few distal joints, you have always some joint range limitation. Okay? So you would like to do the same as before. You would like to do visual surveying. So bring some feature in the image plane of your camera held at the end effector uh, at a specific location. And so the robot should move in order to do this. But still, you don't want to violate the joint limits, because otherwise the robot would stop, would not be able to perform that motion. And this is what happened. Of course, there are algorithms behind, and we are not entering into this, at this stage at all. <coughs> so this is a first experiment. And you will see three uh, blocks, so the external view. On top right, this is the view from the camera mounted at the end effector. And here you see the plots of evolution of the joint position. And you have seen a, a first situation where the system is blocked. And now, avoiding joint limits, you see that there is a strange reconfiguration of the arm, which is automatically chosen by the algorithm, so that the feature uh, follow this path and reach eventually the red dot. So now you see the object, which is here. The four dots seen by the camera are exactly where it, they should be. And you never violated the limits. Here, another start with another configuration, and immediately the robot stops and cannot move at all uh, the feature in the image plane. And now, again, applying the same algorithm with a different start, and of course, the validity of a good algorithm is that it works almost every, every time. And again, you see the robot is moving, the camera is moving, so the view of the four feature point on the image plane is changing and they travel in a proper way driven by the error with respect to the position where they should be this is the control problem and eventually they reach the final situation and the evolution of the position variable so of the angle of the joints remain always within the given joint limits okay so this is a uh, kind of a complex task and in fact the motion is completely uh, strange but it's needed because we are asking uh, quite much from this conventional robot arm by the way this arm has six joints so it has six degrees of freedom and uh, I don't know exactly which brand it is but I can recognize the kinematic structure and this is something that you will learn to do just looking at the data sheet or, or to a video or to a picture of a robot, you can recognize where are the joints, if these joints are revolute or prismatic, in this case they are all revolute, uh, and then uh, being able to describe the kinematics. And with the kinematic model, you can solve a lot of problems. With the differential kinematic model, which is the mapping between the joint velocity and the end effector linear and angular velocity, you can solve other problems like the present one. Here you need something more. You need to model also the camera view, how points in the Cartesian space, three-dimensional Cartesian space, are mapped into points in the image plane. And once you have all this mathematical tool, you can decide to invert these relationships and understand if uh, the task requires some motion in some space, in this case in the image plane space, then the joints of this robot should move in this and this other way. Okay, so this is the main point. So again, as a motivation for the things that we are going to start. Uh, this is another work that, again, dates two years ago. We have been working a lot with uh, this problem. So in this case, uh, in the previous two cases, you have seen only the robots in a, in a lab working by itself. Again, why, why is this situation? Because 
uh, people around the world study the basics. So they don't re are really interested in the final application. But once you develop a portfolio of capability for the robot, then you go to the application and you solve a real problem. Okay. So in this case, we were considering the huge relevant problem of coexistence between a robot and a human that share the same workspace. So this is a situation that, as I already mentioned this, up to a few years ago was impossible to have in an industrial setting because of very restrictive safety and with good reason, safety uh, requirement. But since the advent of lightweight robots and since the advent of more advanced sensing technique and devices at low costs and with the use of some smart algorithm, then you can have this coexistence. So here in this uh, video you will see the same robot as before, uh, the same former PhD students that developed the other uh, algorithm, so Fabrizio Flacco, uh, sharing the same workspace. The robot is programmed to do some task like before, going around three points, cycling, whatever. Then the human enters the workspace and the robot tries to do the task, but the first thing, the most important thing he has to do is to avoid to collide with the human. Okay. Uh, in this case, we are using an external uh, RGBD camera, so a depth sensor with a camera, actually a Kinect, an object that now you can buy for less than 80 euros. Okay. And with this camera, we are able to detect the position of the human. Of course, we know also where the robot is, and we can compute distances in real time. Uh, we remember, we discussed it about real time. Uh, so, in this case, real time means in a, as fast as we can in order to avoid collision. And of course, if the human is really going against the robot, probably the, the robot cannot avoid the collision. So eventually it stops or it's trying to be very compliant and goes away but again here you, you don't have a complete solution in the sense that there may be collision huh? but this could be intentional accidental collision are avoided okay uh, before starting the video what can i say more so uh, these distances are computed and then the robot uh, diverge from the original task in order to avoid contact with the human and as soon as possible, as soon as he understands that the human is away, resumes the original task. Okay? So this is what we are going to see in this video. So in this first situation, the task for the robot is just keep the initial configuration. And Fabrizio is moving his end against the end effector. And you see on the left side uh, the computation of the distances between the, these blue lines that appear are the actual uh, identification of the hand location and computation of distance with respect to the end effector. So if this becomes too small, the robot will move and then resume the initial position. Of course, it's not just with hands, it could be with object like this bowl taking the hand. Uh, and now the robot changes task, it has to move uh, through three Cartesian points, uh, one, two, three. And again, Fabrizio enters the workspace, so the robot abandons this motion and then resumes as soon as possible. Of course, you can put whatever you want. You can also put object in the workspace so that the end effector is not going against this object, but the rest of the manipulator may hit them, so they are treated as obstacles. So we 
should be able to change the configuration while doing some task, like moving my elbow in this case, in order to avoid this collision. So here you see that multiple control points are considered, so you will see on, on the structure many green or blue lines appearing, because this distributed control point, not just placed at the end effector, we compute minimum distance to object, and of course if any of this is too close, there will be a coordinated motion so to avoid the obstacles. Okay? Question on this application? Okay, your qu question from your colleague, I will repeat it for the benefit of the recording. He has, uh, does the body of the robot interfere with the visual, uh, with the view of the, of the Kinect? It does. It does because we are only using one Kinect placed some, somewhere. The view that you have seen on the left side is the view from the Kinect. So, which means that if the robot is standing in front of the Kinect, whatever is beyond it cannot be detected. Mm? So we have some gray area, mm? uh, which uh, if I'm coming from that side, of course I cannot recognize where this object, the human, is, so I cannot compute distances. So how do we solve, so in this case we place, we decided to place uh, the Kinect so that the workspace is maximally visible. Mm? But uh, again, we are not able to uh, prevent this situation. Uh, it's a matter also of uh, how large these objects are because I, I must really <laughs> make myself very small in order to uh, sneak in the workspace without it being seen. But this is a general problem. So how do you solve it? Well, the easiest way is you mount another Kinect so that you cover from one side or the other all the workspace. So you have gray areas, occluded areas from one sensor, but the combination is able to monitor at best the workspace. And you have also an optimization problem, how you locate two or three sensors. You may have also different type of sensor. You may have cameras, you may have just a uh, uh, present sensor that are not able to say how far is this object, but just that along a line of sight there is something, okay? And then you can combi combine these sensing devices and optimize the location so that you minimize this uh, occlusion effect, okay? And the other thing is that uh, since you know where the robot is, because you're commanding the robot, your program is commanding, so you know where the robot is at some point. You can remove the robot from the, from the picture so that you avoid to have self-collision. Okay? So if the robot is doing this, uh, you know that it will not collide, but it's coming too close, so if you don't understand that these two objects are part of the same robot which is moving, you may stop the motion. Okay? So there are a lot of details that I cannot present, but again, please make questions so that I can <laughs> tell you about it. Other questions? Okay, so this is, uh, I named this video or this uh, whole story as sensor-based robot control because we are controlling the motion of the robot based on sensor information acquired in real time, online, while the robot is moving, in dynamic environment, because the environment is not static. There are things moving. In particular, there's a human moving there. But this applies also to other situations, this kind of uh, collision avoidance and distance computation. For instance, if you're moving with a car in the traffic, you have a very dynamic environment. You don't have humans, and you have humans on, on, on white stripes, but uh, otherwise you have to avoid collision with other uh, mobile agents. You may have some information on what they are going to do, but you never know. So this is uh, another main problem that had to be solved before uh, autonomous car could uh, travel in traffic like the Google car, okay?
So the last video is one step ahead. I hope it, you can see it. Sorry. It's very good. Uh, so this is taken in our lab in the basement. We are using uh, another robot, which is a KUKA, with six degrees of freedom. This is an industrial small size robot, because it's this big, more or less, from the surface. Uh, it weighs more than the lightweight, but again, it's not too much, because we are talking about 50 kilograms. In fact, its payload is about 3.5 kilograms. Okay? Uh, and in this case, we don't have any external sensing. So uh, there's only onboard <coughs> proprioceptive measurement. In particular, we can measure the current that uh, flows in the circuits of the motors, of the electrical motors. And this current is more or less proportional to the torque that the motors are applying. Okay. We can measure this, although we cannot change it. And the other thing that we can measure is just the position of each joint. We, we are using the onboard encoders to understand that this joint is at 90 degrees or at 0 degrees, and uh, this other joint is whatever. Okay. This information is provided on the, uh, to the user through a, an interface. And in this case, this interface is outputting this information uh, at a relatively low rate, every 12 milliseconds. Okay. Internally, the system is commanding motion at less than one millisecond sampling time. Okay. But this information is provided outside. Uh, on your PC, which is interfaced to the robot, you elaborate these signals and decide if something is happened, good or bad, and then try to modify the command to the robot. So you need to wait 12 more milliseconds before you can command a different motion to the joints of the robot. Okay, so this is the picture. We don't have any external sensor, no camera, no Kinect. And what, uh, what was the task? Was, uh, again, human-robot interaction, but now we get physical. So we would like to get in contact. And in particular, we would like to detect, first, if there is a collision. Remember, we don't have an, a, a camera that overlooks the situation, so that you say, okay, pay attention, you're getting towards two I mean, dangerous close to the robot, so the robot will stop or will move, or you have a signal, you have a red light flashing, whatever. Okay. We don't have these things. So, we can only detect a collision if a collision has occurred. So, if somebody touches you, how do you detect that he has touched you? You have tactile sensors. Hmm? You have the whole body of a human is covered by tactile sensors. So imagine that you don't have this. How would you detect that somebody is touching you? Resistance. Resistance. What do you mean by resistance? Um, if you touch the robot, you give him uh, a feedback with your force. Then uh, he responds with the uh, opposite force to resist. Okay. But first of all, the robot should understand that there is a force. And there is no force sensors hmm, in the robot. But the resistance, so your, your colleague said, the robot tries to resist, and then something happens. So first, the robot should be able to understand that you have touched him. But the concept of resistance is good, because in fact, the robot is doing something. It's doing something, it's again moving up and down, whatever. We don't care. So if you touch him, you tend to impede its movement. Why? He's commanded to execute this movement. So it tries to overcome this, automatically overcome this, by applying more current to the, to the motors. Okay? It's like you have to push, uh, so you push more. So you can detect this variation. And since the system is programmed 
properly, this variation are a significance of a collision. So the robot stops. Okay? And after a while resumes the motion. And this is the first part of the video. Now, how do you say in Italian, l'appetito viene mangiando? So while you're eating, you, oh, you can do more. So for instance, we can distinguish if the collision is accidental, so it's hard in a sense, so I'm really moving and I hit the robot, and then the robot stops, or if it's soft, and we intend in this way, uh, soft means I want to touch the robot because I want to engage a physical collaboration task. So the robot stops again, but changes its modality, and it's ready to do something with you. Okay? Uh, last year, in October, we performed an extensive uh, campaign with your colleagues, with 29 students, which visited the lab, and we instructed them to hit the robot, and then to hit it soft or hard, so intending, and we made a statistics of behavior. And the results were pretty good, so collision was detected uh, properly in over 95% of the cases, especially after some training. So not in the first place, but when you repeat this experiment with the same person, next time it's much better. So there is some learning because at the beginning you don't know <laughs> how the robot will behave. While distinguishing between intentional contact or accidental collision had lower uh, performance. But again, this for me, it was uh, for all of us and even for the students was a success because again, this robot was not intended for doing this. Okay, so after many words, I will start the video uh, and we will comment. So the first part, this is Milad Geravan. This was a, a master student like, like you that made his thesis on, on this. And now he's at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, okay, let's, let's see it. So the robot is moving and then first he puts his uh, arm, then his hand and the robot stops. It's, uh, these are uh, recognized as hard stop. Even this is a hard stop. Now you will see a soft stop, so it takes his both hand and softly uh, decelerate the robot. And at this point, the robot behaves uh, like a passive one. So by pushing it, it, you can change its configuration. Or you can have uh, a kind of compliance behavior. You remember the, the KUKA lightweight. Huh? This is completely different. It has, it has no sensor, no joint or sensor, but you can push it and it reacts like a spring, huh? a program spring. There's no, nothing inside the controller that is able to do this. So we are mimicking you know, this behavior. So I think it's quite nice. Uh, I noticed that with this, with this uh, projector, you don't see almost anything. I mean, it's much better <laughs> on, on the screen. But remember that all this material is on the website. You know? It's in zipped folder, so you can download it and, and, and then look do it again at home. Question on this? Okay, so we conclude this part with some, uh, we move back to more traditional parts. So what is uh, the organization of exams and, and beyond the exams? So first of all, uh, we will have during this couple of months probably a uh, I call it homework. Maybe homework is not the right word. It's a class work where you can use whatever you wish and you do some self-evaluation. Okay, so I provide to you at some point an exercise which is like those that you uh, will do during an exam and then I can grade you. But this grading is just for your own sake, just to understand if you're catching up with uh, the course or you need more study, okay? And then the, the actual exams will be with a written test and an oral examination. 
So, the test is, you have many examples of this on the website, on the course website. And the oral examination, uh, it's an additional question on the whole program. Uh, in order to be sure, uh, this is for me, be sure that I got your preparation correctly. Okay. Uh, all sessions are already open on InfoStud. So these are the dates. There will be two in, uh, in the break between the first and the second semester. Uh, then two at the end of the next semester, so in June, July. Then one after the summer break. Plus you have two extra sessions for students of the previous year or if you are a part-time student. I mean, you, you know how this works. There are special categories that can access to this. Question on this? Uh, if you're interested in these topics, then together with my colleague at the robotics lab of our department, so with Professor Oriolo and uh, uh, Marina Renditelli, uh, there are a number of thesis subjects. You can see a list on the website of the robotics lab in Italian, LabRob, Laboratorio di Robotica. Uh, although this is not uh, an exhaustive list, just to give uh, an idea. I would suggest, in order to understand what we are doing and where we need your help in performing these activities so that you can make your master thesis and we can look for funding hmm, to buy more equipment and uh, have possibility of uh, uh, Provide, giving places to collaborators and so on. Uh, so, apart from going there, go to our YouTube channel where you, you find organized in playlist uh, a number of videos, including those we are putting there, only our work, so only the videos that, of uh, activities that we have performed directly or in collaboration with some partners. Okay. So uh, I invite you to go there and if you like it, uh, just give us some feedback. And if you have questions, just give us some feedback again, okay? So I would like to conclude with uh, uh, just a mention, huh? so I, I'm not going to discuss this, just a mention of what are the other topics that we are not going to cover in this course but which are part of uh, the second course in robotics, uh, robotics too. So uh, we will do a lot of kinematics uh, in robotics one, differential kinematics, direct and inverse, differential uh, study of singularities and things like that, how force are transformed in static condition. But there are some other topics which are left in kinematics, so in particular the handling of redundancy. So the fact that a robot has more degrees of freedom, more joints than those strictly needed to perform a given task. Okay, so this is a relative concept. You don't have a robot which is redundant or not. It's always the same robot may be redundant for some task and not for the other. For instance, if you have a we have already commented this, how many degrees of freedom you need to characterize the position of an object in the Cartesian space, three, x, y, z. How many do you need for characterizing the orientation of this object? Again, three in a minimal setting, three angle, and this can be defined in different way, and we will see this. So, if you want to place an object in space with uh, some orientation, you need to assign six variables. And the minimum requirement for being able to assign the six variables in different position and orientation within a limited workspace is that the robot has six independent joints. Okay? So that we can do this. So uh, this is why the large, largest part of robots have six degrees of freedom. And typically they are all revolute, but this is not very important. They may have a, a mix, a mixture of uh, revolute and prismatic joints. Now, 
If this robot, so a conventional industrial robot, needs to do the following task, do some uh, arc welding. So it has a welding tool, and with this, we or let's say, uh, spot welding. So just shot once uh, on a metal, so that this metal gets glued together with another part. Now this task requires less than six degrees of freedom. Can you imagine why? So, of course, you need to bring the gun to some point. And then you have to reorient, because if you're shooting there, it's, it's not good. But still, you need only five degrees of freedom. Why is that? So suppose that you brought your tool where it should be, and now you just need to point in one direction. Okay? And for pointing, you need only two angles. Okay? Because around the pointing direction, there will be a, a third angle, and there is no difference when you're doing the shot there. Huh? So, in fact, you have positioning and pointing in space, and this requires only five variables to be described. But your robot has six degrees of freedom, so what you're doing with your extra degree of freedom? And this is the topic of redundancy. Hmm? For instance, you can use redundancy in order to do the same task, but avoid hitting the joint limits. So you're trying to have this extra condition, and you're trying to do the best out of it. And again and again. Okay? Then the other part, which is very important, but it's covered only in robotics too, is dynamics. So in all this basic course, we will just describe the motion. So we will say, okay, if the joints are moving like this, the end effector is moving like that. Or if I want that the end effector has some velocity in some direction, then I have to move the joints in that direction. And from the contour point of view, I will give this input to the robot controller and rely on the fact that this velocity is going to be executed. Okay? But this is not really the case in general, because if I want to execute some velocities, and my robot is 1,000 kilograms, then it's obvious that I need more energy than if the robot is 10 kilograms. So where is this difference? This difference is inside the dynamics. So where I need to consider the masses of the links, the inertias of the link, the presence of gravity. Uh, when links are moving simultaneously, there is some coupling effect due to Coriolis and centrifugal forces, and so on and so on. And this is the subject of dynamics. And based on this, we will revisit control techniques, which in the first part of the course, so this first semester, are purely kinematics. So we will design some uh, feedback controllers in the Cartesian space or in the joint space, but essentially assuming a simplified kinematic model of the robot. When we take into account the full dynamic model, then we need to do more uh, for controlling it properly. And we'll see several several techniques. In particular, visual servoing is done in the second part, although we're following a kinematic approach. So visual servoing, like in the video that we have seen together, uh, we are following only a kinematic approach because the, the core of difficulty is at the kinematic level. So this topic may be brought to the first part of the course, but it's still, still there. And then uh, additional topics of robotics too are diagnosis and isolation of robot faults, in particular of actuator faults, so how you detect that something is not going in the right way. So before you have a damage in, what, in, the, in the execution of the task, you can stop the robot. And then this final part that, as you have seen in the video, all the mathematical and algorithmic details are treated in robotics too. So we won't see this. I use this only for motivation purposes. OK, I think we can uh, uh, stop with this part, and I can move to the
the next presentation. I'm saying this for our technician that <laughs> needs to. So I will skip this. And Okay. So in this uh, half hour before the break, uh, we'll start considering uh, presenting a, a number of uh, industrial applications of robotics. But the first thing we have to do is to define our domain. So what is a robot? How we can uh, say that some me mechanical, electromechanical object is a robot or not? Things like that. And also provide a little bit of history of robotics. So, what is a robot? Well, here there are, of course, you, you may be aware that there are uh, international association of standardization of everything, in particular of terminology, which is quite important. This is a definition which I call industrial. Huh? So we're talking now about ro robots, not only industrial robots, but this will be our first uh, subject of study. So this is made by the Robotic Institute of America, RIA, and it says uh, what you, I mean, I, I, I don't go to read this, but pay attention to the red parts, which are the most important ones. So it's a manipulator, so it's a mechanical device which can take things, move them around, manipulate objects, okay? It's multifunctional in the sense that it's not built for one purpose only. Not just for drilling holes or for uh, packing uh, uh, carton boxes. And this multifunctionality is exploited because the system is reprogrammable in an easy way. And so now this means really you have a program and you change the program, the robot is doing something else. Of course, for doing something else, he may need different tools, but just like a human, huh? with bare hands, we cannot hammer things, we cannot screw things, uh, we can hold things because we have a very, very flexible end effector. Hmm? So the robot, in fact, there's a whole bunch of studies trying to uh, devise robotic hands, dexterous hands, that are similar to the human hand. We may comment on this later on. So, manipulator, multifunctional, reprogrammable. Uh, then, of course, all these parts are intended for industry. So, this is intended for a robot which is sitting in a production line. So handling material and making transformation, doing a variety of tasks. But then another part, which is in red, which is very important, which is acquiring information from the environment. Now, the first generation of robots didn't have this. The only way in which it knows about what it has to do is commanding, writing a piece of code where things that it has to do. If something changes in the environment, the robot was completely lost. Okay, this is why, for having successful, and there have been many industrial applications, the environment around the robot was very highly structured. This is the terminology that is used. No? Structured environment. Which means the conveyor belt needs to be placed here in this exact position and never change. The parts are coming 
in this place and only in this place, and so on and so on. So you have to structure the environment around the robot, and this is very expensive. By and large, uh, if a robot costs X, then the same amount should be put to structure in the environment around it. If the robot is not able to explore his environment and the change in the environment with its own sensors. Okay? So acquiring information from the environment is important. And these sensors are of ma multiple nature. They may be on board of the robot or placed in the environment, but then should communicate with the, uh, with the core controller of the robot itself. Okay? And then the last part, then do, I mean, acquiring information is not enough if you, don't, if you don't process this information and do one thing or the other depending on the nature of this information. Okay, so this is uh, one thing that is acceptable. Hmm? Uh, here is another one, ISO, International Standard Organization, is another important uh, institution, international institution, and again, similar thing, automatically controlled, reprogrammable, multipurpose manipulator, programmable in three or more axes, and then here is another distinction, maybe either fixed in place or mobile, which means that we include here all the large kind of transporter, AGVs or wheeled or legged robots because they are moving their bases while most of industrial robots were fixed place. By the way, they could be mounted on the floor but they could be also mounted on the ceiling or on the walls. For instance, in very compact uh, lines of production of cars, there are a multiplicity of robots that collaborate working on the same car body from many different base positions. Okay, so you have up to eight robots doing uh, welding or uh, uh, other mechanical operation on, on, on the car body at the same time. So pay attention, three or more axes. This is very important. Hmm? Actually two may, may be enough sometimes but certainly not just one axis. So if you have a, a CNC machine with a drilling uh, tool that progresses in one direction and rotates, this is not yet a robot. Although it may have a sensor uh, to understand if the material is soft or hard while progressing, uh, probably monitoring the currents in the, in the the motor, and uh, it may be reprogrammable, certainly, but it's still not a robot, okay? So if you have at home a kitchen robot mm, in your kitchen, which does a lot of things, is this a robot or not? Or is it just a brand name in order to sell it more easily? I would say, first of all, only one rotation. Hmm? Okay. Second, not even a sensor. So the motion is not related to some sensing information. So it's not really a robot. We can call it a kitchen robot. But there's more than just this name. So to make this long story short, here is the definition that I like the most some visionary. Again, three red, three red words in red. So for us, a robot is the intelligent connection between perception and action. So you need sensors, but sensors are not enough because with sensor you acquire data, but you have to perceive something. You have to understand what this data means. This is really perception, okay? 
And then you elaborate on this based on some final goal, and this is the intelligent part, and then you do some action. So you close the loop by moving things or moving the robot itself and changing the state of the world. Okay? So, uh, now with this definition you can explore the things that are around us and see if this may be considered to be robots or not. For instance, is this computer a robot? What is missing? He said no. So <laughs> No, no, forget about this. Now let, let's. Intelligence. Well, intelligence. There are many good programs here. Action is not there. Sensing is there. Maybe you have a cam a web camera. Hmm? Why not? You can recognize faces. So, is perceiving things, and it's also intelligence enough to say who are you but then okay. so I would say that uh, computer science is a subdomain of robotics this is I mean they, they would kill me if I say something like this but but you, you know what I mean by by this okay so intelligent connection between perception and action the first robots were not robots, according to this definition, but more and more, the example that I show you before are fully in this context. So the fact that you have a physical world implies also that you have a lot of uncertainty. Because, especially if you're moving out of the factory floor, where everything is you know, light condition or fixed, you cannot access to some area, all the objects around the robot are fixed in a, I mean, pre-planned, okay? Now, if these robots are really going out of this factory floor, coming in our houses or going on the street and so on, the first thing is that everything changes. So, you have to adapt to different conditions. You have to recognize different conditions, and this is very difficult. So, a multi-purpose robot doing everything like we do, it's still a way of time because there are intelligence robots in limited domain. Hmm? So, for instance, uh, a vacuum cleaner, a robotic vacuum cleaner, one of those that you can buy for 250 euros hmm, in uh, Euronics or other consumer electronics uh, stores, restricted to the problem of cleaning the house and houses only, hmm, floors only, well, it's, it's correct. It has sensors. It can reconstruct the map of your house without that you tell them. He knows where to look for plugs to uh, take energy. Okay? And it moves and changes the status. It cleans, actually, the floor of your house. It can recognize if there are stairs, so it stops before going to falling down. Of course, it cannot open doors if you don't let the doors open, because it has no manipulation capability, just moving and cleaning. Okay, so, but still, it qualifies as a robot, hmm? even if it costs only 250 euros. Here they are. Hmm? These are, uh, on the left you see a, co a couple of Komau robots, Comau is the major Italian manufacturer of robots, provides 95% of robots that Fiat is using in uh, its factories. And not only to Fiat, also it sells uh, automation and uh, robotic lines to the US. Maybe it, I used to say to General Motors, but now General Motors is the same. Huh? Okay. Uh, at the center, and you can see their date of birth, is the Waseda 1-8. Waseda is a huge university in Japan. 
very known uh, in the scientific world for humanoids. And these are the type of humanoids that used to exist. So this, uh, in an exposition in uh, 1984, was uh, robots that could not walk, could do some steps, but really not walk autonomously, but could sit in front of a piano and has a camera on top, reads music, and plays music. Hmm? Okay. Plays whatever music you put in front of him. So, sensing, reasoning, because I understand those notes are, those are connected to keyboards and I have to move my two hands. And if I understand, it's uh, really it was an, an organ, so it could move also the legs and the feet. Very difficult, even for a human, coordinate and play. Okay. Now, you can like or not the music that he was playing at that time. Uh, and in fact, there has been a lot of progresses in uh, robotic musician. Huh? Now you see on the, on the uh, you can find in the net a violin player or robotic player, and things like that. Okay. One thing was the softness through which the finger could touch the keys. It was just on off. Now, in, in fact, you can mo modulate the force. You can uh, adapt a lot of things. Speed was the only thing that was not missing. Okay, because these fingers could move quite fast. And here on the left side, on the right hand side, actually, uh, one of the famous mobile robots that went on Mars. Again, autonomy is another important aspect of this system. Autonomy, so the, the capability of doing so When we say intelligent connection, intelligent means that he does it by himself, not, doesn't need immediate, at least, intervention by a human. So those robots uh, living on Mars should be autonomous, although they are not completely autonomous because they don't explore by themselves the environment. Hmm? Sending images to the uh, ground station on the Earth, there are some uh, experts that say, okay, now you should go there, to that rock, pick that rock. and So this is the long-term goal, but from now on, the system is completely autonomous. So he finds his way to go there, avoiding bigger rocks, avoiding deepest uh, area, because if something happens, there's no intervention from, from the ground station. Huh? It, take, it takes eight minutes to send information back and forth to Mars. So in eight minutes, you lost your robot, and there's nobody going there to recover it. OK. So it's autonomous, but supervised. By the way, we won't cover this type of robot exactly because they are not fixed base. Okay, this is part of autonomous and mobile robotics. So, uh, talking about history, where does this name comes from? So, robota is uh, means work or variation of works in uh, many uh, languages from uh, Central and East Europe. And the first time it was used as such, so to define a humanoid structure, is in a uh, theater play, uh, Rossum Universal Robot, Ruhr, uh, by a Czechoslovakian at the time, a Czech uh, author, Karel Kapek, in 1920. I don't know if you ever heard about this story. The story ended not well, okay? And over the years, over the decades, I, I would say that robotics have also always have this kind of attraction and fear connected to it. Probably because those robots were human-like and the idea that they could substitute us is not really comfortable. Although they should substitute us exactly in those dangerous, repetitive, tedious, boring activities. Okay. Uh, 
so the, the term is robot. If you speak in English, you say robot. If you speak in Italian, you say robot. You don't, you don't say robot, because robot is said only by French people. So please, please, say, talk about robot, even if you're speaking in Italian. Okay? I'm not saying that you're not going to pass the exam if I hear you. <laughs> but so, this is another story. How many of you like science fiction? I don't. But, <laughs> but uh, you, you certainly have heard about these this, uh, laws huh? by this extraordinary writer and thinker, I would say, Isaac Asimov. <coughs> So there may be more than these fundamental three laws of robotics. Uh, let's look at them. First law, a robot may not injure a human being. And then some details. A robot must obey orders given to it by human beings, except if this conflicts with the previous law. It starts already getting involved. And a robot must protect its own existence as long as this does not conflict with the previous two laws. Now, we may ask ourselves, these are very, I mean, very subtle concepts. First of all, let's consider one of these robots that you have seen before. Uh, a robot may not injure a human being. Is this true? So let's, let's maybe let's restrict our domain. You have seen robots uh, on TV or on, on internet working in industrial domain. For instance, in automotive industry, like the Komao in this first picture. Those robots can in injure people? Sure, they can. I mean, if you go there, they hit you. Maybe they don't kill you, but... I mean, it's and this is why all the safety uh, precautionary uh, condition around that robots. Okay. Now, if we move out of the factory floor and we have these robots going, coming at home, I would say that the first law it should dominate everything. I mean, better that the robot crash itself, third law, huh, rather than violating the first one. So human safety is uh, very strong requisite. Second point, a robot must obey orders given to it by human being. How can you command a robot? You can talk to it now, right now. You can recognize uh, all this interaction, cognitive interaction between human and robot are making through gestures, uh, like saying hello or voice command, or in a more conventional setting, you sit on your PC and type in some commands and the robot will do it. This is the whole story. Will the robot do something that you are not telling him to do? What do you think? No. But have you ever heard about learning? Machine learning? So the robot, from his daily life, looking at what's going around, may learn something about its environment and the things that people used to do, and may do this, and eventually may do this better than people that are doing this by themselves. So, again, can they do something that we don't have asked them to do? Why not? But not in the sense of the science fiction idea. Uh, you can sti I still remember a few headlines on newspaper many years ago saying, crazy robot hits. Uh, uh, this is not possible. Of course, even learning, you have to program it. And if it works not as you expect, it's your fault because the program didn't catch all the conditions. Uh, all the variability and things like that. Okay. Last things, robots must protect its own existence. 
Oh, this is very tricky. Uh, we will see one of, uh, later on you will see uh, one of this uh, Unimation Puma robot, one of very successful robot in the 70s. A lot of production and so on. And Well, this robot could quote unquote kill himself. So he could hit and damage its own part. Even if, I mean, the first video we had a table. If we hit the table, of course, the robot. But even in free space, uh, he could hit himself. Why is that? Because it has some displacement of links so that he could really fold completely one of the, the forearm, which was on the side, and hit the body so without any precaution. So he could really, if bad programmed, pay attention, uh, or not. I mean, overlooking some aspect, he could do this. Of course, you may add some protection in your code. You can add some electronic protection, so an extra sensor that avoids this contact. Or you can have, you can put a mechanical stop so that this does not happen. But if you do this, you limit the workspace of the robot. So uh, even if I have uh, an area where I could do, do whatever I wish with this robot, if I start putting this limitation, I will have some hole where I cannot access and so on. So I don't want to do this. And this is why those robots have no limits, huh? additional limits of this kind, neither hardware nor software. But if you specify to this robot to move from one point A in Cartesian space along a straight line to one point B, and this is okay if there is no robot, you can do in free space from A to B, but with the robot, the robot would hit himself, okay? So this is why I'm saying, depending, you didn't uh, uh, preview this situation, okay? So this is tricky, huh? it's tricky. It could, uh, even if it's not injuring human, uh, obeying your order, <laughs> but your order <laughs> didn't take into account this and the robot is hitting itself. Of course, this should be precluded. Th th that robot were not good, according to Isom. Isom. Uh, okay. Now, how do we uh, reach the so-called industrial robot? Th there's a, so, some story behind. So in the 50s, there were two technology available at that time. So it's very old time for you, even for me. I was not born at that time, but almost. So on one side, there had been a development of the so-called CNC machine. So computer numerically controlled machine. So machine center with conventional tool for drilling, surface finishing, and so on. So typical mechanical uh, operation on metallic parts that could be programmed geometrically. So you could specify the path that the end point, the tool point should execute. Okay, So that you can change that time you could use uh, card sheets to program robots. But this is another story. I mean, you can imagine like now you have a code and you change. You specify the, the the programs were very, I mean, the instruction were almost uh, not understandable. They were just a command move or stop and then a certain of number of parameters. And this defines the geometric path in 2D or in 3D, depending on the machine type. Okay. So they were flexible, they were very accurate and very fast. But they were missing the flexibility hmm? because if I have to uh, go and access the other side of an object, I could not mount on it and go to the other side. No? I should take the object, rotate it, and, and then do the same. Okay. This is one part of the story. The other part was mechanical telemanipulators. This is a, a, a telemanipulator whose name is Mascot, was developed by the uh, now named ENEA, so the National uh, Energy and Alternative Energy 
institution of Italy. Okay. For handling uh, radioactive material. So if you recognize from this picture, there's a human at the, uh, far away manipulating a passive articulated device. Pass. No? Moving this object, which is passive, so there has no motors. In fact, the only motor, so its actuation is given by the human. But it has sensor at the joints, so that it can measure this position. And this position are transferred to the this equivalent copy and commands the motion of the joints. Okay, so this is called a master-slave manipulator. The master is driven by the human. The slave reproduces exactly the same motion. Why is that? Because uh, if this is a radioactive material, you don't want to be there. You want to stay in a different room or far away or beyond some screen. Uh, overlook the situation with the camera, probably, and do this remote operation. It's very, it's very difficult to do this, but this structure needs to have the dexterity of human arms, so they can do different orientation with their end effect. Only uh, all the, the whole intelligence was on the operator, on the human side. Okay. Now. Telemanipulation has made huge progresses. Mm? Uh, in particular, in medical robotics, in surgery. In fact, the oh, operator, the surgeon, is telemanipulating some robot, mm? doing some uh, orthopedic uh, heart intervention or other non, non so invasive operation in the uh, surgical room. But it has a lot of feedback. I don't know if you ever tried to mount small parts together with gloves, let's say box gloves. It's very hard. Why? Because you're missing the tactile sense. Even if you're looking at the part, I mean, you, your vision helps you in bringing together the parts. Without vision, it's maybe more difficult even just looking where this object are, but when you're engaging and really pushing hard, then you need to feel the forces. It's the same here. So force feedback from here to the human operator, which moves things, is very important. And there are a, a number of so-called haptic devices which do exactly the, the same, where the human operator has a, a manipulator, moves this manipulator, and feels forces on the manipulators coming from remotely. And the nice thing of this is that this remote may not even be a real world, maybe a virtual world, a video game. And in fact, video games are exactly the same. You, you drive something, then the car is bumping, and you feel this on your driving wheels. It's exactly the same concept. OK? So feedback is very important in this system. So, uh, but this drives us too far away. So in the 70s, some people decided to say, OK, why don't we merge these two technologies and make the best of both worlds? So we would have something which has a flexibility of use, like in telemanipulate, articulated telemanipulators, adaptability to unknown condition, because here there was some human there. But Still, accuracy in positioning, like a CNC machine, and repeatability. You can do forever the same motion, and it's exactly like that. OK? And this is, was the first manipulator. And here is the Unimation. Hmm? There was a patent in the, in the US, actually, by the patent was by George Devil, but uh, Engelberger helped in developing then the actual robot and is considered to be one of the father of uh, industrial robotics, modern industrial robotics. Okay. Now you see that this robot has had six degrees of freedom. Uh, we will see a, a short video later, but 
here it's, uh, there are two joints at the base, so this object, uh, now I'm mimicking it, can do this rotation and can do this rotation. Okay. Then there's a third degree of freedom inside this big box, and this is a prismatic joint that goes up and down, so it can extend or retract. Now this is a joint that a human doesn't have. I cannot do this with my hand with my arm, because my joints are all revolute. Mm? There is no <laughs> translation. And then, at the, at the end, there were three revolute joints with axes that intersect always in the same point. And this is the so-called spherical wrist. So the spherical wrist can assume any orientation within some joint ranges. And this is, was used at the end of the main joint axis, the three joint axes were for positioning and the last three for achieving the right orientation. Okay? Uh, well, I think we can stop for the, for the moment here uh, and then resume in about 15 minutes. Okay.